five, chapter five is integumentary system and an integument means cover, the covering system. And this covering system, these are the learning outcomes and this is what we will be going through. And again, integument, this is the largest system of the body and it's important to know that it's two parts that we will go through. Cutaneous membrane, cutaneous is another name for skin. And accessory structures are the structures related to the skin. Like what's related to the skin, the nails, the hair, the glands. These are together are called accessory structures. So cutaneous membrane, which is another name for skin. Skin itself is two parts, outer and inner. Outer is what you touch here. If you touch, you're touching the outer one. And this is called epidermis. The inner one is called inner derm or derms. Outer is epidermis and inner is derms. So it and, and it is basically derms. And remember epi, like epicondyle, above, epi. So epidermis is what's above the derms. The derms itself, which is the inner one, is connective tissue. Remember, we talked about the epithelial tissues before, and I told you there are epithelial tissues and connective tissues and muscular tissues. And the epithelial tissues are everything that's covering or lining, right? Like your skin is part of it. Underneath that, there is connective tissue, and connective is what's connecting. Okay? Basically, connective tissue goes by exclusion. If I ask you about certain tissues, you ask yourself, is this is covering or lining? If so, it's epithelium. Is it muscle? Does it contract? Yes, it is muscle. No. Is it nervous system? Nerves? No. That's it. You don't have to memorize it. Everything else is connective tissue. Bone, lymph, uh, fat, anything else is connective tissue, even cartilage and bone. Accessory structures are these things related, uh, these organs related to the skin, hair, glands, and nail. Under the whole entire skin. So what's a skin? Dermis, connective tissue, and epidermis, epithelial tissue. Together, this is cutaneous membrane or skin. Under the whole entire skin, which is not part of it, it's underneath. There is a layer called hypoderms. So here is the derms. Above it, or superficial to it, epidermis. That's it. Those two together, skin, cutaneous tissue. Derms, epidermis. This is connective tissue. This is epithelial tissue. Together, this is the skin or cutaneous membrane. But I'm telling you that there is another layer under the skin. So hypoderms, if this is the derms, epidermis, hypo is under. Epi above, hypo under, okay? So hypoderms is under the derms. Obviously, this is not part of the skin. Or subcutaneous. Sub is the same as hypo. So subcutaneous under the skin, it's the same thing. But you need to know both of them. Is it hypoderms, subcutaneous? Same thing. And this is basically connective tissue as well. So derms is connective tissue, hypoderms is connective tissue. But... The subcutaneous or the hypoderms contain the fat. So if you say like, I'm gaining weight, right? You're gaining weight, what do you mean gaining weight? I'm putting, uh, putting on some more fat, where? Most of it is here, under your skin. And this is called the hypoderm. And if you uh, got uh, an injection before or a vaccine or something that's under the skin, they are still talking about this. Hypoderms, they say subcutaneous injection hypodermal injection they are talking about under the skin which is which contain mainly most importantly fat if you look at this this is a cutaneous membrane this up here both the purple and the orange this is the epidermis and then all of this pink is the derms obviously this is the hypodermis Look at this yellow here. They always put a yellow color for the fat. Okay? All the pictures, you will see yellow color for the fat, and it looks lobular like this. So this is where if they inject under the skin, they're injecting into this fat. 
and there is a reason for that. I don't want to go through it. It's the solubility of the agent and stuff, but anyway, they always inject in the fat. So epiderms and derms. The derms, which is the pink part, there are two parts of it, two layers. The superficial one is called papillary layer, and the uh, the the uh, the bottom one or the lower one is called reticular layer. Okay. Um, why did you call it papillary? Because there are papillae. Papillae are these tops. Look at this. These tops up here. These are called the dermal papillae. You, you see that elevation, elevation, elevation. These are called papillae. Since this layer has papillae, it's called papillary layer. The other one contains reticular uh, tissues, so we call it reticular. Uh, you should notice here that look at the epiderms, the blue or the purplish blue. There is absolutely nothing there. You will not see like blood vessels or nerves or anything. There is nothing there. It's just the outermost layer here that's just for protection. Dermis, on the other hand, is what contain everything. You will see... Uh, blood vessels, look at this red, arteries, blue, these are the veins, uh, look at the hair follicle right here, look at the muscle inside, glands, look at the glands here. So even though the hair is going to penetrate the epiderms and appear outside, so we see it on the surface, coming out of the surface, um, it just go through it. But where is it located? Like the root? in the derms blood vessels it goes up but it does not reach the epiderms there is nothing in the epiderms but just layers of epithelial cells and uh, uh with that said it's it, it we always say it is a vascular structure a vascular non-vascular remember a a n i n i m do you remember these prefixes all of them means no so it is avascular. Uh, how, how does it like get its nutrition then? If it doesn't have blood vessels. Blood vessels feed the different tissues with oxygen and nutrients, right? This is what the blood for. How does it get it? You get it from the underneath. It just the, the oxygen just to squeeze itself and go there. Nutrition, same thing. They don't have their own blood vessels, but they take it from the underneath. But it is avascular, and this is important to remember. Uh, if you look at this picture here, you see again the same thing. Here is a, a subcutaneous or hypoderms, which contain all of these yellow, which is fat. It contain the big blood vessels and nerves. And then the medium sized and small ones are located in the derms, not exceeding that and not reaching the epiderms. We have different glands that we will talk about. We have different uh, structures that we will talk about. And one of them is this one right here. Look at the root of the hair, like this. This is the follicle located inside the um, the dermis. And the shaft, oops, the shaft here. And then it will penetrate through and pass through so we can see it from outside. Look at this gland right here that's opening into the hair. This is a gland that's called sebaceous gland. Generally speaking, rule of the thumb, glands are called after its secretions. So if you, if, you, if you get a name, know that this is the name of the secretion. Like sebaceous gland, it secretes something called sebum. Sebum, sebaceous. Okay? Serous gland, the secretion is serous. Okay? Ceraminous gland, ceramin, and so on. This is uh, where the name came from. Um, so you will you will see these glands opening to it, sebaceous glands, and sebaceous glands they secrete kind of oily secretion, not oil, it's oily, a little bit oily, and that's to uh, soften the hair as it is growing until it appears out, and for that reason you should have uh, uh, enough amount of oily secretion of that um, uh, sebum. Otherwise, if you don't have enough or you don't, if you have extra, I think we all hear about these different types of shampoos, right? They say this shampoo is for dry hair. This shampoo is for oily hair, right? They are talking about this. They're talking about this gland. It should secrete enough amounts, 
not too much, not too low. If it is low, your hair is dry. If it is high, your hair will be oily. It's because of the sebaceous glands. Um, otherwise, these are the sweat glands. Again, the gland itself is located here in the, in the dermis. Uh, and then it, its uh, ducts will, will go all the way to secrete on the surface of the skin. Functions of the epiderms protecting the underneath tissues. And it's all it should all make sense. This is physiology. Just think about it. Why do you have skin? Protecting the underneath structures. This is one. The other thing is excretion. We know that the sweat is secreted on your skin, right? Sk sweat is not water. It's water plus. Plus what? Anything extra that you want to get rid of. Don't we get rid of the stuff in the urine and feces? Yes. If there is something that's extra, we get rid of it in the urine. Uh, I'm sorry, in the, um, in the sweat. So it's also for excretion. The other thing is body temperature don't you get your skin looks kind of pinkish flushed a little bit if it's hot and it's pale or sometimes it's the tips at least will be like bluish a little bit right if you think about it this is for uh, regulation of the body temperature if it is getting hot your blood vessels dilate in the skin so that the inside blood do we know that the outside temperature like the blood that's here in the skin, under the skin, is different than the core blood inside. There is like one degree difference. It's warmer inside. So if you dilate in the skin, the blood will go more to the skin. The deep blood carrying the heat will go out and then the heat will be lost. This is how we regulate. On the other hand, if it's getting cold, you need to preserve. You need to keep your heat, right? So you constrict so that no more blood Go to the skin you don't lose your heat so this is another function maintaining normal body temperature in both cases cold or hot um, melanin we make melanin in the skin and this is what give us it's not the only one by the way not the only thing it's the main thing that give us our skin color you get darker if you have more melanin you get lighter if you have less melanin and melanin is uh, uh, protecting us against the ultraviolet radiation, okay? And that's why if somebody's darker, he's more protected. If somebody's lighter, he's less protected from the ultraviolet uh, irritation. Uh, it produced keratin just to make the skin stronger. Vitamin D, we actually make it in the skin. Even though we activate it in the kidney, but we make it in the skin. And that explains... Uh, those kids that um, they don't go outside are not exposed enough they get rickets do, do you hear about rickets the weak bone those kids have weak bone and it's just kind of bending a little bit yes it's because rickets um, I will show you pictures but uh, rickets is basically bone is weak why you're not exposed to sun so, so what Yes, ultraviolet radiation, even though we, we always say it's bad, but reasonable amount is not only good, it's you have to have it. You can't live without the sun. So uh, the ultraviolet radiation will make your skin make vitamin D. And vitamin D is extremely important for the bone. Okay? So where do we make vitamin D? In the skin, by the ultraviolet radiation. Where do we activate it? Because it's inactive. When you activate it in the kidney, you will see it later. Storage of lipids. This is the subcutaneous tissue underneath. We, we store our extra lipid underneath uh, in case when you need it. Um, uh, stimuli. Like you feel something, you touch something. If there's something painful, something hot, warm. All these sensations will come from the skin. It also coordinates immune response. Why? Again, protection. It prevents bacteria and things from, from entering to your body. Now look at this again. The whole system is cutaneous membrane, which is the skin with its two parts. Epiderms, this is the outer part. And dermis, this is the inner part. The inner part is two parts by itself. Papillary, which is the top. And then reticular, which is the bottom. 
and then we will talk about hair glands and uh, nails so starting with the epiderms what kind of tissues is that stratified squamous epithelium we talked about epithelium and it was in your exam what stratified means layers strata layers squamous means flat flat or squeezed flat so stratified squamous epithelium does it mean that all the layers are squamous epithelium and that's why we call it stratified squamous epithelium not necessarily right the top one it means the top one has to be squamous how about the underneath it doesn't matter we when when we have multiple layers which we call it stratified we give the name according to the top layer only so the top layer at least is uh, squamous here it is again a vascular there are no blood vessels where do you get your nutrients and oxygen from the underneath layer which is the next layer which is the dermis this is how the epidermis and the dermis fit together uh, remember why did we call i just mentioned it why did we call the upper layer of the dermis papillary because it has papillary papillary because it has papillary look at these projections can you see this this and this and this these are called the dermal papillary the epidermis on the other hand they have something called epidermal ridges so they fit together so that the two layers stay together look at this 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 whole my hand is the dermis this is uh the reticular layer and this is papillary layer why did you call this papillary layer papillary like this okay papillary layer so these are the dermal papillary how about the epidermis above it it has something similar but we call it ridges not papillary not papillary epidermal ridges they fit like this it's meant to be like this the epidermal ridges fits with the dermal papillary they fit like this okay and these epidermal ridges when they fit they will give you your fingerprint so if i ask you like fingerprint where did you get this from it is the epidermal ridges when they fit into the dermal papillary now the types of cells this is extremely important to know and the first type of cells are called keratinocytes keratino means keratin it's a type of protein that's tough sites means cells right keratinocytes the cells that contain keratin and this is basically the vast majority these are the tough cells that's protecting you these are the main ones not the only ones the main ones and they are tough because they contain a lot of keratin how many layers do you have in your skin you should not answer it depends because we have two different types this in the palm of your hand and in the sole of your foot this is called the thick skin this is five layers anything else that's not those two is thin skin because it's only four layers and i will tell you exactly which of the five layers is missing in the thin skin which layer is a different like four and five yeah, four are the same what's the fifth one i will show it to you but this is something that you need to know your skin is four layers except for the palm and sole this is called the thick skin and everything that i'm talking about is a question or i would have skipped it okay so you expect questions about these what are the major cells of the skin keratinocytes the tough keratinocytes uh what kind of skin do you have in your palm and so thick skin how many layers uh, in a thick skin five which layer is extra in a thick skin you will see it i will tell you the four and five so this is how this is the dermis right here this is the epidermis above it and there is a basement membrane here uh but here are the five layers that you have to know and in that sequence clear you have to know it by name and in that sequence from the bottom and even you can get it from the name the stra stratum means remember stratified strata layer 
So every one of those is called stratum something, means la the layer of something. Stratum bezel. What do you, what the bezel sound like? Base. Base. Bezel means base. So this is the bottom one. Clear? If you forgot it, remember this. Bezel is at the base. So this is the lowermost one. And then we will go up one by one. Followed by spinosum, followed by granulosum, followed by lucidum, followed by corneum. This is five. So where is that? Palm and so which one is the extra one that's here that's not in the thin skin lucidum the lucidum all of the following are in the thick skin except uh, in a thin skin except example okay which of the following is in the thick skin not in the thin skin lucidum and translation of all of these bezel means base the one at the bottom spinosum means Spiny. Do you remember the spines of the, scap of, the, of the skull? Do you remember these spines? Different spines, projections? Yes, it looks like that. Granulosum because it has granules, like bags. Lucidum, lucidum translated into transparent. Okay? Corneum is coming from corneo, and corneo means tough. So obviously when I touch what I'm touching now, corneum. This is the outermost, and of course, it makes sense that it has to be the toughest, right? This is the one that's the, the outermost. If something is touching you, you're touching this. If something is hurting, it's going to hurt this. So it has to be the corneum, which is the top layer. Look at these layers right here. Start from basal. This is at the base. Spinosum, because it looks like they have a spiny appearance. Granulosum because it can it contain different granules. Lucidum transparent, and this is the one in the thick skin only. Corneum is the toughest, the strongest, and it is also water resistant. What do you mean water resistant? It preserves your water. And what what do you think will happen if you like got a burn? or bruising or something. Don't you see like fluid oozing from it, right? Because you're losing this layer. Any scratch, you will see fluid oozing out of it, right? Because this is water resistant, tough and water resistant. We have things to say about each one of those. Um, so these details are needed or I would have skipped it, okay? Um, Bezel, the one at the base. The other name for it is stratum germinativum. I know the names can be hard, but you have to know. Germinativum is coming from germinate. Do we know what germinate means? Germinate, like you produce something. It's germinating. So germinativum, because this is the one that germinates. Germinate what? Germinate the other layers. So if you, if you lose, this is the one that's going to give you a replacement, right? Do you know that you lose your skin, the, the superficial ones, you lose it almost on a daily basis? You lose it and replace it. Lose it, replace it. Who is replacing it? Germinativum. Because it germinates other layers. You lose it. By the time you lose it, the germinativum is germinating more cells, keratinocytes. These keratinocytes will go like next, next, next until it reached the top, replacing the, 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 um, the last um, cells. Um, this bezel, which is the basal one, the one at the base, the germinativum, the one that germinates, in order to germinate, it contains stem cells. Do you remember the stem cell? Everything has stem cells. This is like the stem, from which everything originates. The grandmother cells, if you want to call it this name. Stem cells are located there, and that's why it's called germinativum. This is one. The other thing is, for Bizal, um, this, is, this is the one, since this is uh, the, the, the lower one, the lowest one. Remember, we have dermis and epidermis above it, right? 
and they fit together like this. Dermal papillae fits with the epidermal ridges, and this is responsible for fingerprints, right? So this is the one that contain the epidermal ridges. Fingerprints, I talked about it, and this is from the epidermal ridges. Here it is, look. These are the epidermal ridges, and that's what's responsible for it. What else do we have? We have uh, tactile desks that's called Merkel cells. This is for uh, sensation, not the most important, but the most important that you have to remember, melanocytes and stem cells. These are the most important two. You cannot forget it. Melanocytes, stem cells. Stem cells, these are the ones that's going to germinate and make other layers to replace it. Melanocytes, these are the ones that make melanin and contain melanin. And of course, we know melanin is that uh, brown, black uh, pigment that give us our... It doesn't give us our skin color. It's the most important one. Okay? Next layer is spinosum. And it looks like spiny. And just understand why it looks spiny. Just because if this is the cell, the cells are going to dry off. Do you remember the, the skeleton of the cells? We talked about this. Do you remember the cytoskeleton, the skeleton of the cell? So when the cells shrink and dry, it's going to dry on that skeleton. So the, the skeleton will be protruding like spines. The spines will be protruding like this. Like when you see somebody who's cachected, don't you see his bone, right? The bone will be very, very obvious, right? Same thing. It's when it dries, it give you can actually see the skeleton, the side of skeleton. So it gives you that um, uh, spiny appearance, and it contains cells for immune response called dendritic or Langerhans cells. Next layer is called granulosum, and we call it granulosum because it contains granules. It contain granules. What are the granules? Granules are like vesicles, like bags. And what do we have in these bags? Keratin and keratinohyalin. Two things, keratin and keratinohyalin. Where are these located? In these granules. And that's why you call it granulosum. Okay? That's it. Granulosum, the granules contain those two. This is what I want you to know. How about the lucidum? Nothing much. Just know that lucidum means clear or transparent. Clear or transparent. And this is the one that's in thick skin only. That's what we need to know here. Corneum. Corneum, corneal. Corneal means tough. This is the superficial one. The horny, the tough. It is tough. It's water resistant, right? I mentioned that before. It's highly keratinized. What do you mean highly keratinized? Like it's full of keratin. Remember the keratin, this tough protein? Keratin is a very tough protein. And um, did you did you guys like um, hear about these lotions and stuff that contain keratin? If you ever bought something like that, uh, they say like um, your skin will be better and be more resilient and right? Uh, it's, it's not very accurate, though, but the, 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 the point I'm trying to make here is the more keratin you have in these, la in these layers, the more resilient the skin is because this is the one that's filling these cells, keratinized. It's important to also know that the cells travel from the stratum basal to corneum in 7 to 10 days. Okay, and this is your turnover. This is your turnover time. Okay, like uh, how many times do you replace your out outermost layer of the skin every se seven to ten days? Why? Where did you get that number from? This is the time that you need for the cells produced in the bottom layer, which is basal, to go to the next spinosum, granulosum, lucidum, until it reach the corneum. That takes seven to ten days. And that explains why do we change our, our superficial layer 
every seven to 10 days. Now, losing the water is going to be through two things, two ways. How do we lose the water? I'm not talking about urine and feces. This is the main part. Other than that, there is one of them that's sensible. And sensible means you sense it, you feel it, sensible. And this is the one that we lose it through sweat. We know that we lo lose water. What's a sweat? It's water plus, right? Water plus other things. So this is our sensible way of losing water. Perspiration is losing water. How do we lose it? Sensible, sweat. The S should remind you the S. Sensible, sweat. Okay? And this is the one that you can sense it, feel it. Don't you feel it when you, you, you start to sweat? You sense it. So this is the sweat. How else can we lose our water? Is insensible way. The one that you cannot really sense it. And this is different things, but if we're talking about the skin, the most important is the water underneath. Remember I told you the, 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 the stratum corneum is water resistant. And the epidermis, generally speaking, is water resistant, isn't it? So it it, it does not allow water to, 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 to be excreted or leave, but just a little amount of water squeeze itself in between the cells and go to the surface, and you don't even see it, it evaporates. Okay? So this is sensible, it's like sweat. You see actual water, right? You see actual sweat. Sensible. But this one is not... It's not a gland that's secreting something through a duct. No. It's just the water very slowly squeeze itself until it goes to the surface and then evaporates. Okay, so um, this is called insensible perspiration. And this is the one that will increase dramatically if you have burn. Because if, you're, if you have burn, 100% of the time, the stratum corneum is gone, right? Whatever the degree is, what's less than that, right? If you have burned, there's nothing less than losing this one, the superficial one. You can lose more and more and more with the degrees of the burn, but the minimum is you're losing this. So it's not water resistant anymore. You lose a lot of water and that replaces, if you ever heard about this, they say this person has got like a first degree burn, just get some uh, ointment or lotion or something, you're fine, put some ice or stuff. Second degree, it's a little bit harder, give you this uh, vesicle. But third degree, hospitalized. One of the hospitalization is because of you losing a lot of water, you get dehydrated. So they have to give them, uh, if, if you ever experienced that or saw that even in the movie or something, if somebody's having this um, uh, burn that's uh, dangerous or I mean, uh, third or fourth degree, they give them that IV. Okay, you will see the, the IV in cannula. They have to give it to them. There are, there are calculations that are done to determine how much do you need, but, but anyway, you're losing a, a lot anyway. Uh, this factor called epidermal growth factor or EGF is the one that stimulates the epiderms to grow fast or slow this is what the one that determined uh depending on different things uh but anyway it's it's produced um from the duodenum and the salivary gland and from the name epidermal growth factor the factor that make the epiderm grow right that's it the factor that make the epiderm grow and this is the one that determine um how fast so how it's going to promote the division of the basal cells. And what are the basal cells? What does it contain? Stem cells, isn't it? So if you promote the stem cells, the stem cells will work faster and it will give you more layers, right? Also, keratin, accelerate keratin, so the keratin goes into the cells. Do you remember that the keratinocytes are the major cells, right? The major ones. Others are small uh, numbers, but this is the main one. Repairing and glandular secretion is another thing. The next layer is called the dermis, and I mentioned that the dermis is outer papillary and uh, deep reticular. Papillary layer 
is the one that contain papillae, right? But the papillae fits with, it fits with what? Epidermal ridges, yes. It fits with the epidermal ridges. Um, so this is the papillary layer. And if you hear about dermatitis, it means this layer is inflamed, dermatitis. Did you hear about dermatitis before? Inflammation of the skin? Yeah, dermatitis is this layer specifically, uh, epidermal layer. Uh, underneath it, the lower one is called reticular layer. And both of those are connective tissue. Um, the dermis is strong and elastic at the same time. Elasticity is the degree of stretchability. It can be stretched because it contains collagen fibers and elastic fibers. Collagen and elastic fibers. Collagen is the one that's strong. Elastin is the one that's stretchable. And that's what you need to know. What do we have in the derms? Why it's strong and elastic? Strong because of collagen, elastic because of the elastic fibers. That's it. If that skin got damaged, can happen for different reasons. Uh, you're going to lose the skin turgor, which is this wavy appearance. Uh, dehydration. If you're dehydrated, you lose it. Um, don't you see, like, if somebody's dehydrated, you see, like, some wrinkling in the skin, and what is this? Are you, like, aging or something? No, it's something temporary. Aging is another thing. Hormones and ultraviolet radiation is one more thing. And there is one more that's called stretch marks. Did you ever see or hear about the stretch marks? Stretch marks come only if you are you gain weight, whatever the weight is, either you're actually gaining weight or pregnancy, okay? And then you lose it all of a sudden. If you lose it gradually, you're not going to form these stretch marks. But like in pregnancy, you can't control it, right? You're pregnant and then tomorrow it's gone. So when you lose it all of a sudden like this, there are stretch marks, they usually go away uh, but occasionally it can it can leave just a little bit of marks um, can be barely noticeable some some others can get it like a little bit more and th this is in pregnancy in females but males get it as well if you like lost weight all of a sudden like you, you make surgery or something that makes you lose like a uh, hundred pounds in a couple of months this is too fast so you get the stretch marks here are the two types of fibers, collagen and elastic. Again, collagen is a strong, elastic is elastic. This is the one that's stretchable. Lines of cleavage or tension lines. The only thing that's important about these lines is in um, a plastic surgery or cut wound or something. Look at this picture here. And, and actually, if you look at your own hand, you will see that there are like kind of lines, right? You will see it going like this, 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 and this way is going like this. It goes in, in specific direction. And the bottom line here is if you cut parallel to the line, to these lines, this will heal better and it will not give you uh, any uh, marks or something like this, any scars, okay? If you cut uh, across the lines, it will give you that mark, okay? So plastic surgeons, they are perfect in this. They know exactly how it goes. So if I'm, if, if I'm going to do something like here, I will, I, will, I will open like this, this, and if I want to get fat out of whatever, I have to cut like this. If I cut like this, it will leave a scar. But if you got injured, it's out of your control, right? It, it's it's your luck. If you got injured and, and the injury is like parallel, it will disappear and you will everything will look fine. If it goes like across it, it will leave um, a mark or a scar. And usually the scar gets like smaller by the time, but it doesn't completely disappear. Line of cleavage is what you see here. 
and and all what I want you to do is what I just mentioned. If you do do a surgery, if you have a wound uh, or something injury, whatever, it depends on parallel or uh, or across. In the dermis, of course, we have I mentioned that we have blood vessels, we have the nerves, we have the glands, we have the lymphatics. All of this is not in the epiderms, right? It's all in the derms. So we have this cutaneous plexus, which is these arteries. And then we have capillaries coming out of it. Do we know the difference? Arteries, the big blood vessels, taking the blood away from the heart. Arterioles are the smaller ones. Capillaries are the smallest of all, the smallest blood vessels. So uh, if you hear about contusion or bruising, you're talking about damage in the blood vessels of the derms, right? Like if I do this, if I, if I accidentally uh, scratch my, my, my uh, arm uh, in something that's rough and you get this, this um, bruising, okay? And you see like it's, it's turning like red, bluish or something like that. Of course, you're not talking about the superficial layer. It doesn't contain blood in the first place, right? So we're talking about the underneath, the derms. So look at this picture here. Look at the big blood vessels at the bottom and look at the smaller ones going out. At the top here, this is the capillaries. The capillaries, the smallest of all. And again, if you have bruising, you're talking about this because there are no blood vessels in the epiderms. Nerve supply. Where, is, where are the nerves? Is it in epiderms or derms? Dermis. There is nothing in the epiderms, just cells. So uh, innervation is located in the derms as well. Of course, at the, at the, at the um, subcutaneous or hypoderms as well. Uh, but sensation, you have receptors for sensation. One of them is called tactile or mesoner, and the other one is called lamellar or pacinium. These two are for touch and pressure subcutaneous i told you what we need to know about it subcutaneous under the skin or hypoderms under the skin right what's the importance it's the layer under the skin it contains the big blood vessels nerve and others and this is where we store our fats and this is where we do our injections that's what i want you to know okay and I told you, usually we try to inject in the fat because the fat spread uh, the anesthesia really fast. And these are the fat cells. Look for this. Okay, skin color. Skin color come mainly from melanin plus keratin. And there is a third one, but these are the main ones. So obviously melanin is the one that's brown to, to, uh, to black, right? Dark brown to black. But this is mixed with keratin. The keratin will give you that uh, yellow, uh, orange color. So it's a mix. It's not purely melanin. It's a mix of those. Keratin is coming from carrot, right? And we know carrot is either yellow or orange, right? So it's mix them together. Get some brown, more or less, whatever, and add some keratin to it, orange, yellow. That will give you your skin color. The melanin, where are the melanocytes? If you're following with me. Melanocytes, in which layer? Which of the five layers? The first one, which is called? Basal, yes. Or, what's the other name? Germinated, yes. Basal or germinated. This is where the melanocytes we make it there, we put melanin in it, there, okay? So it's in the stratum basal or germinatum, same name. So this is where, where we produce melanocytes. It's very important to know that the skin color does not depend on the number of the melanocytes. It depends on the contents, the amount of melanin. What do, what do you mean? I mean, I can have less melanocytes than you, but I'm darker than you. 
I have less cells, but they are producing more melanin. So which one determine? Not the number of melanocytes. It is a factor, but the bottom line is the amount of melanin itself. Okay, how dark, how light? It's the amount of melanin, not the number of melanocytes. Is that melanin, is that, melanin that give us our uh, part of our color, is that bad? No, actually, it's protective. Again, it's ultraviolet radiation. Ultraviolet radiation damage the lighter the color means less melanin. It means less uh, damage. The, the more melanin, the more absorption of the ultraviolet, the less destruction. And that's why they notice that the, um, the major skin cancers, they happen more in the lighter colored because of the damage happened by the ultraviolet. Damaging what? Damaging the DNA inside uh, the skin, the skin cells. Okay, so it's actually protecting. Keratin is orange yellow, and this is just uh, another uh, factor that gives us the skin color. And keratin is the one that's converted to vitamin A. And vitamin A is important for, this, for the skin. We hear about vitamin A deficiency, right? Vitamin A deficiency. And they tell you if, you're, uh, if your skin, uh, if you want your skin to be good, uh, eat keratin, right? Eat keratin, I mean, right? Because of this. And it's also for the vision. So these are the locations in the stratum basal of the melanocytes right here. They produce the melanin. And look how the melanin goes up. This is a melanocyte. They make the melanin. And the melanin start to spread and go up, detach, and spread in the different layers of the skin. So how many factors for the color so far? Two factors. Here is the third one. It's not only melanin, which is uh, brown, black, plus keratin, which is yellow, orange. You add the third to, to this is the blood flow. Okay, uh, so it, which is kind of, you add a little bit of pinkish, right? Some of us will have this pinkish color more than others. It's all about the, 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 the blood supply, the blood flow, the blood that's going in your skin. The bottom line is the blood contain red blood cells, right? Red blood cells contain hemoglobin, right? Hemoglobin. If it contain oxygen, it's red in color. If it, if it does not contain oxygen, it is blue in color. This is what we need to know. The bottom line. Okay. So the oxygenated blood which is red, give us this tinge of reddish, pinkish kind of. So now the bottom line is some melanin plus some keratin plus some oxygenated blood. Add those together. This is your skin color. Three colors together. Okay. Brown, black, uh, orange, yellow, plus pinkish red. Okay. Um, if you're oxygenated, if you have more blood going to your skin, okay, th if this blood contains oxygenated, it's oxygenated, it means there is oxygen with the hemoglobin. The color is red. No oxygen with hemoglobin, it looks blue. And that's explain it. Did you ever have this uh, when it's really, really cold? You can have like the tips of your fingers or you can have your lips uh, or your... Um, uh, the toes, right? Did you see that getting a little bit bluish or purplish? Or did you see it before? This is basically deoxygenated blood because less blood is going, less oxygenated blood, bluish. Uh, so if if that the case, if the blue, if the if the if the blood is deoxygenated bluish, this color blue is called cyan. Cyan. Cyan is purplish blue. Is this name clear? Cyan is purplish blue. So we call that cyanosis. If you're getting, if your skin getting uh, bluish discoloration or purplish, but it's bluish purplish, even it's purple. Bluish purplish. If that's the case, we call that cyanosis. Okay? And it can happen 
uh, to some people, especially infants, can happen to them if they have heart issue. They don't get enough ex oxygenation, and those kids looks actually uh, kind of bluish discolored. They have to give them oxygen. But I just want you to, to know this name, cyanosis, bluish purplish discoloration. It can happen normally if it's extremely cold. You have it like in different tips of the fingers. And in that, if that's the case, it's something temporary. Other abnormal skin colors. So what's the abnormal skin color that we got so far? What's a normal? Melanin, keratin, oxygenated blood. Clear? This is normal. Abnormal, cyanosis is one. Jundis is yellowish discoloration. And jundice is coming from the buildup of a product that come from destruction of the red blood cells that's called bilirubin. Okay? You guys know that after 120 days, our red blood cells do not work anymore and we have to recycle them. When you break it down, one of the products is bilirubin and we should get rid of it. If you don't get rid of it much, it accumulates and give you that yellowish discoloration. Uh, pituitary tumor, the, the pituitary gland, do you remember the pituitary gland? Do you know the pituitary gland? One of these glands inside. Um, if you're leaving, just sign out, okay? If you're coming back, that's okay. The pituitary gland secrete different types of hormones. One of them is MSH, and this will give us uh, a different discoloration. Addison's disease is another thing. Addison disease is an issue with the pituitary gland that will give us uh, another color. Vitiligo uh, is something that's kind of similar to albinism. Do we know what's albinism? Albinism that's white, white, not fair color, not light color. No, it's white. Okay? No melanin. So if this, no melanin all over the skin, we call it albino, right? If it is patches, we call it vitiligo, patching white. And there is absolutely nothing bad about that. Some people think it's like uh, uh, contagious or we should stay, absolutely nothing. It's just the body is producing immune cells, destroying the melanocytes, that's it. This have nothing to do with you, right? With, with somebody dealing with them. It just, this piece, this piece, patches, the melanocytes are destroyed, that's it. Because I hear some people think it's contagious or something. Of course it's not. Here it is. So obviously the body is making antibodies attacking the melanocytes in these parts. Uh, I mentioned that, that we make vitamin D in the skin. And this vitamin D is called cholecalciferol. This is the inactive. It will become active in the kidney. And we call it calcitriol. So... Where do we make vitamin D? In the skin. How? Ultraviolet radiation. Is it active? No, it's not active yet. You call it cholecalciferol. How is it going to be active? Kidney. The kidney will make it active. What do you call it if it is active? Calcitriol. So what's calcitriol? Active vitamin D. Okay, it has to be activated in the kidney. Calcitriol. Okay? And this is basically important for calcium absorption. I think we know what's absorption, right? When you eat milk, let's say milk, cheese, whatever, that contain calcium, it goes in to your stomach, to your intestine. In order to absorb it, you need vitamin D. Okay? And if you don't have vitamin D, what's going to happen? You will not have enough calcium, right? If you don't have enough calcium, you don't have enough calcium in your bone, your bone will become weak. In children only, we call it rickets. Can adults get rickets? They don't get rickets, but they get something that's milder, that's called osteomalacia. They can. But like, like, do you think you can stay indoors 24-7 for a year and without having any issues? No, you will have issues you will get something similar to rickets, not as bad. It's called osteomalacia. So rickets is in children. So here's what happened. You eat, 
food. The food contains calcium. Um, with vitamin A, made, we make it in the skin. Sunlight, ultraviolet, we make it. It go to the to the liver first, and then go to the kidney. In the kidney, it get activated to calcitriol, and you do need to remember these names: inactive and active vitamin D. It has to be activated. What do you call it when it's activated? Calcitriol. It's even the first part, calci, calcium, right? Calci. Calcitriol is active vitamin D that help calcium and phosphorus absorption. Look at this picture. This is rickets. This is a child who was not exposed enough to the sun. So with sun exposure, there is ultraviolet. Ultraviolet helps the skin to make vitamin D. What's important for vitamin D? Absorption of calcium. So if you don't have enough vitamin D because you're not exposed enough, you don't absorb enough calcium, you don't have enough calcium, your bone does not have enough calcium. And of course, we know that the calcium is what makes the bone strong, right? More calcium is stronger, less calcium is weak. And that's why the weight make it like this. For your information, this is correctable. Even though it looks like this, if those kids uh, expo they get exposed to sun and then they get vitamin D treatment or something, uh, the bone will correct itself. Accessories. Yes. It's reversible. Yes. As long as you start exposure, enough exposure, not overexposure, of course, enough exposure, and they need to get vitamin D because it's too low. The vitamin D supplement. So accessories starting from the hair and going to the different things. The hair cover everything except what are the parts that are not covered? Of course, the palm. You don't have hair in your palm. The sole doesn't have it. Your lips. External genitalia, uh, good part of it does not contain hair. There is hair around it, but the genitalia itself, a good part of it does not contain hair. The hair itself, why do we have the hair? Aside from it looks good or something, but the actual function is insulation and guarding. The hair follicles, and I showed you that in the picture, where is it located? In the derms, right? The hair follicle itself is in the derms. And hair, the hair and the nail, both of them are keratin as well. Nail and hair are keratin, okay? So it's non-living, basically. Your hair is non-living. And that's why if you pull your hair, you feel pain. But if you cut your hair, do you feel any pain? Of course not, because it's not living. It's just keratin, okay? But why do you feel pain if you pull your hair? Because only at the bottom there, in the dermis only, there is something called the root hair plexus. There are nerves at the bottom only, and blood supply go to the follicle within the, the dermis. There is a muscle that's called erector pili muscle that cause the goose bump. We know the goose bump, right? When your hair gets like straightened and erected like this, we call that the goose bump. It is erector pili muscle. A muscle attached is like this. Your hair normally like this, okay? And here in the dermis, there is a muscle attached to it. When this muscle contracts, your hair go like this. Like if it's cold or you're frightened or something, and then it, it relaxes, it goes back. So this muscle uh, is called erector pili muscle translation. Erector is coming from erection, which is straightening like this. Uh, pili is the name for the hair. Erector pili make the hair straight like this. And inside, there is a root and shaft. And I showed you the root in the dermis. And the shaft is the one that penetrates through the, um, the epiderms. And here is a picture right here. So this is uh, the root right here. And this is the shaft. The shaft is growing. And then it's passed through those two, which is the epidermis. And, and, and it appears outside. Uh, I talked about the sebaceous glands and look at the erector pili muscle. It's right here. 
the goose bump and sebaceous gland for secreting uh, sebum erector pili and sebaceous gland if you have a cut section of the hair you will see these layers and I'm not going to go through into uh, much details in this just know generally speaking that you have the medulla inside and then there is cortex generally speaking and there is cuticle and then the different layers internal external and glossy membrane these are the different layers we don't have to go through the details just know the names the medulla in the middle and this is the keratin the soft keratin outside of it the cortex is the hard keratin which is this orange right here okay and then you have the cuticle outside of that and then you have the internal followed by external followed by and there is a glossy membrane before this so these are the different layers in cut section uh, don't worry much about the details just know these names only okay another picture showing you the same thing uh, this base here of the of the root is called the hair bulb and this is the hair papilla in which look at the blood vessels going and the nerves if you pull it the nerves are here and this is where you feel it so medulla is the innermost and this is the one that contains soft keratin cortex intermediate hard keratin cuticle is the outer layer internal external and glossy membrane okay so medulla cortex cuticle internal external and before them there is the glossy membrane <clears throat> uh, we start the hair in the hair bulb which is this bottom part and uh, the hair shaft start to grow until it appear out Um, when the hair when it start to grow from the roots it make the hair itself which is keratin shaft and start to grow 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 until it stop growing we call it the club hair okay and the club hair is the one that's going to uh, shed and replaced by another hair okay there are two types of hair that we need to know one of them is called the villus and the other one is called terminal. Vellus is the one that's soft. Terminal is the one that's heavy. Okay, where do you have your terminal here? Just look at your at yourself. The terminal here, this, this, right? The eyelashes. This is the, the, the thicker or the heavy hair, right? But look at the rest of the hair. It's just the soft hair. So you have it only in certain parts like this like this like this around the genitalia is the same thing it's it's um, uh, thick and heavy so eyebrow eyelash this and around the genitalia and this and around the genitalia only at puberty before puberty in children the hair is still soft it does not change to become terminal hair unless puberty come and this hair start to become heavy and thicker right uh, the hair color is determined by melanocytes, which come from, um, determined by genes. But this is melanocytes. Unlike the skin, three things. This is melanocytes only. Sebaceous glands, you do need to know that this is associated with the hair. And what's the secretion called? Sebum. And this is oily secretion to make the hair softer. And then we have the sweat glands. The sweat glands that we all know, that, that produce all that sweat all over, this is called eccrine glands, eccrine, okay? But there is another, a special type that's called epocrine. Crine means secretion, by the way, secretion. Epo and ec, and I'll talk about it. But generally speaking, what are all these sweat glands? 
a crying lens. Following? Are we following? Exceptions. Epocrine. What are the epocrine? The epocrine are located in specific uh, spots uh, around the genitalia and your armpits after puberty. And this is more for sexual attractions. It's it break down the secretions. It break down and produce uh, a specific smell. But it's only under genitalia, around the nipples and the, uh, and uh, in the armpits. Otherwise, everything else is a crime. Uh, these are the sebaceous follicles. Uh, most of them, they secrete on the hair as it is growing, and some of them secrete on the surface. Are we following? Sebaceous gland secretes sebum, which is oily secretion, okay? Uh, and, and it is most of it is secreted on the hair as it is growing, to make the hair kind of oily so it is soft. There are some of them that secrete directly on the, uh, on the scalp, on the surface of, of, your, uh, of, the, um, of the scalp, okay? And this is also to make the, the surface itself, not just the hair, to make it kind of soft. Here are the epocrine glands I talked about. These are not the common glands all over your body. These are special glands only in the armpits, around the nipples, and around the pubic region, which is around the genitalia. Um, and it secretes sticky secretions and these sticky secretions when they break down they produce an odor again it is supposed to be for uh, sexual attraction but just understand that uh, these are uh, specialized not the regular sweat glands it's not for cooling your body down it's not to reduce your body temperature this is have a different uh, function related to puberty and uh, and sexual attraction and all that stuff uh, it produces an odor, basically. Here are uh, the epocrine glands. Again, location is important and the function is important. Armpit around the genitalia, around the nipples, uh, and it become more active around puberty. Ecrine or merocrine is the same thing, and these are just the regular glands. You do need to remember this. Ecrine or merocrine, same thing. These are the regular sweat glands. Epocrine are special ones. Locations, I talked about it. And basically, these regular sweat glands to produce sweat, and I told you that the sweat is mainly water, but any extras should go into the, into the um, uh, e even uh, salt. Did you, did you ever see somebody like sweating hard and then when it dries off, you see some whitish discoloration on the skin? Did you ever see that before? This is salt. This is sodium chloride. Uh, because if you have a lot of salt, normally we get rid of it through the urine. If it is beyond that, the body has to get rid of it somehow, and it will secrete it through uh, your sweat, and that's why the sweat is kind of salty. Of course, nobody is going to uh, like taste his sweat, but if you do, it is actually salty. Of course, don't do it, but I'm just telling you. Okay, so these are the different lens. Uh, the next are accessory structures or other glands are mammary gland, and obviously mammary is uh, the, uh, the the glands within the breast that make the milk. Okay, and of course it, it, it become uh, more active during uh, pregnancy. Uh, so mammary glands are the glands that produce milk in the breast. Next are called serominous gland, and I told you the name come from the secretion. Memory, milk, sebaceous, sebum, serous glands, serum, or serous secretion, serominous, ceramin. If you forgot it, it's the same name of the secretion, okay? Serominous gland. What is the serominous gland? It's, it's a gland that secretes ceramin, and the ceramin is the air wax. I think we know the air wax, right? This is the scientific name. It's called ceramin. Okay, and obviously this is happening for a reason. It's there to trap anything that's going in and prevent it from going in because of the very delicate 
eardrum, right? The eardrum, if you touch it, you can easily just uh, cut it, break it down. So we're not supposed to let anything go in. Yes. What is it? They do, but it's not active. And some men, they might have um, a little bit bigger. It's called uh, gynecomastia. I don't know if you guys heard about that or not. Some some uh, males, they can have... Uh, uh, breast is males and females. Both have, have uh, this uh, breast. But it is bigger and contain more glands, more glandular, bigger. And of course, it's active during pregnancy in females. But males do have it. Uh, it should kind of be kind of flat, but um, some men have like extra hormones or something. It can be a little bit bigger, and this can be corrected hormonal, uh, whatever, if you're interested to know about it. Uh, so this is for the ceraminous gland secreting the air wax. And all these glands are, secre uh, are uh, controlled by the autonomic nervous system. You do not... Like, uh, can, can you sweat right now? Can you sweat? Of course not, right? So it, you cannot control it. It's not uh, the somatic nervous system. It's, it's autonomic nervous system. And autonomic coming from autonomy, right? Autonomy, which is automatic. So the body is getting hot. You have nothing to do. Your nervous system will send the signal to your glands. Secrete more. Produce. You get the sweat. If it is cold, it's not going to do that. Same thing for thermal regulation. The blood vessels, you do not make your blood vessels dilate or constrict, right? It happens automatically. But it's all the autonomic nervous system depending on the situation. Nails consist of different parts. Uh, let me just show you the picture. We'll give you what we need to know. Here is a nail. Um, this part here, this skin fold here, this is called uh, the proximal nail fold. And then you have the eponychium. And the eponychium is basically, uh, some of us will, will have this habit that, that you like push the extras like this, right? Some of us do like this. If there is part of it growing with the nail, you push it back or sometimes you get rid of it. You're talking about the eponychium. It should grow a little bit with the skin, but if it's going too much, usually we tend to remove it. And then you will see this light colored, uh, lunar shaped structure of the nails. This is called lunula. And lunula is coming from lunar shaped. Okay. And then you have the body and then the free edge. Uh, I, I, I mentioned this is proximal. Uh, a proximal nail fold and there is lateral nail fold. Uh, the the uh, the lateral nail fold should stop the nails from growing laterally, right? The nail should grow forward only. It shouldn't grow laterally. What what if it grows laterally? What do you call this? This ingrowing nail, ingrowing nail. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's usually like either you're wearing like a tight shoes or something or uh, uh, or your the fold is not very strong. I had this issue, by the way, uh, years ago uh, in growing nail. Uh, it used to grow on one side and actually literally get, get into the uh, the big toe and it goes into the skin itself and penetrate it. Okay. It hurt so bad and uh, I used to do surgery for myself. Yes, without anesthesia, <laughs> I have the, the tool to just pick it in and flip it, cut. Um, yeah, I, I, I know the bottom line, what, what I should do. Right, okay, I'm a doctor. I know that I have to do injections, and I'm not go I don't want to do injections. The injection itself is painful, right? Uh, if, if I wanted to do that, I have to do like one injection here and go in and out, and then one here, go in and out. This by itself is painful enough. So... I just get over it. My wife is my wife is screaming. <laughs> Are you crazy? Getting the equipment, no anesthesia. Just flip it, cut, get rid of it. But anyway, it, it stopped coming uh, because I stopped wearing these uh, tight shoes. I know that my lateral folds are not 
that strong probably so it's, it's but I did it a couple of times uh, anyway this is for the lateral folds and uh, actually the front part is called the free edge this is the part that we cut and get rid of it all the time here are the lateral folds and this is what I was just talking about look at this it's it's just passing this and goes in it was very painful here it is again uh, here is uh, the root and um, if you by the way if you lost your your nail it's going to regrow the only way that it doesn't grow like like some people literally have this whole nail they have like a, an accident or something and the whole nail is gone and they think it's gone and they, then it's replaced it normally it should be replaced the only way that you completely lose it and it's not going to be replaced is if you lose this uh, the nail roots all the way in here because this is the stem cells usually what when it's broken down you broke down this even all the way to here okay and this is replaceable from here all the way to the end this is replaceable as long as you didn't injure this again the stem cells are here so they reproduce it uh, here is the proximal fold this is the eponychium I was talking about which is the one that we get rid of it Lunula, the body, um, uh, the free border underneath is the hyponychium. And basically, nechium means nail. Hypo means under, right? How about this? Epi, epo. Eponychium is above. Epo, epi. Hypo means under. This is the one that we should clean under the nail, under the free edge. It's called hyponychium. So the part nechium means nails this is nails in green um, now the repair if you have injury or something what's going to happen if you have injury in your skin what are the steps and this is important to know what exactly happened if you have injury it's going to bleed first right and then the bleeding is going to stop and then this part will be swollen or swelling I mean and it will be painful so what happened here is if you have it injured, the injured cells will start to release chemicals and these chemicals are going to attract some types of white blood cells to start the process of inflammation. And inflammation, these cells are called mast cells. Mast cells. These are the cells of inflammation. Mast cells. So these cells are going to start the inflammation process and uh, do we know what are the signs of inflammation? If you have like inflammation in your skin, what do you notice? Exactly, red, swollen, pain. Last one, warm or hot? Well, it's warm or hot, but it's, it's more warm, but it's, it's okay. But these are for, called the four cardinal signs of inflammation. And every one of those happen for a reason that there is an explanation for each one of those. Why is it hot or, or warm? Why it is, it, is it red? Why is it painful, swelling and so on? Um, so what happened here is broken cells produce uh, some chemicals attracting white blood cells to come to that area. Mast cells and macrophages. This is what you attract. Are we following? You got an injury, releasing chemicals. Chemicals attract many white blood cells. Most importantly, mast cells and macrophages. Why? Mast cells trigger inflammation process, which is the start of the healing, basically. And the other one is macrophage, and macrophage are the big eaters, right? Do you remember this? Macrophage. Phage means eat fat macrophage the big eaters what do you need to eat of course i have some damage so those damage should be removed if there is anything that's not supposed to be there it will be removed as well so it's the macrophages are cleaners they will eat anything that's not supposed to be there and then blood is going to coagulate later uh, it will form a, a scab to stabilize the area and then it will be 
when, when the, the actual skin regrow, we're losing the scar. So look at this. Here's the inflammation process, chemicals, bleeding, and then the white blood cells come, uh, mast cells specifically, starting the inflammation process. So bleeding and attraction. Then the area will be filled with blood clots. And the bottom part will contain something called granulation tissue. It's fibrous tissue. You, you need to know these steps, by the way, the steps of healing. Okay? If you have a wound, secretions, chemicals, uh, bleeding and chemicals. Bleeding, blood clot, filling it. Okay? Plus, mast cells starting inflammation process, which is what's going to lead to healing. Macrophages cleaning the area. Granulation tissue, which is fibrous tissue, the bottom part, would be replaced by um, granulation tissue that comes from cells called fibroblast. What's a fibroblast? Fibro means fiber. Blast means producers. The cells that produce something. Fibroblast, the cells that produce fibers. Producing fibers. What are the fibers? The fibers are something that's connective tissue that fill this area, fill this area at the bottom. And then the epithelial cells are going to migrate like this. Like see the arrow? It's going to migrate around it. And when it migrates, it's going to heal it, like uh, regrow. And you still have this. Uh, the, the scalp is getting smaller. Until uh, the epiderms recover the area. Uh, sometimes it leaves a scar. And this scar usually uh, shrink and almost disappear. But in some people, it can change to something called keloid. Did you ever see it before? And instead of this uh, scar, tiny scar that gets smaller and smaller, it actually increases and become bulging, right? This is called keloid. Are we following? Keloid. Uh, is this keloid something dangerous? No, it just doesn't look good. Okay, so most of the times you just remove it. Here it is. This is called the keloid. Um, aging, with aging, and this is going to be at the end of every chapter, just it goes without saying, with aging, everything deteriorates. You name it. Uh, what happened to my skin? Weaker. Uh, thinner. Right? Uh, blood vessels, less. Vitamin D, less. Right? Healing, less. Follicles, less. Sweat, less, less. It's everything... Unfortunately, this is the aging process, so just choose the bad one. This weak or strong, weak. Fast healing or slow healing, slow healing, right? Uh, all the functions are going to deteriorate. The repair is going to, to deteriorate, okay? And here is the integration between the integumentary system and others. And that uh, is the end of this chapter.